I oh somebody was my mother was asking me about you know why people don't trust the media anymore and I'm like I never did I mean I don't know if you if she taught me that somebody taught me we were always taught be skeptical don't they, they both they they've all got agendas who knows I'm like do people really trust what they read I was so no, never don't trust what you read in the newspaper was how it was originally taught to me right mm -hmm. and then it was the internet which was even worse because anybody could publish on the internet. <laughs> All right, um, let's, let's read something that is trustworthy. Like that say? God's Word? Okay. You can trust Jesus. Why can you trust Jesus, by the way? I am the truth. Well, you, well, you said you should, but that, there are a lot of people that say, just trust me. Read my lips. <laughs> I remember somebody saying that. No good taxes. Yeah. Why should we trust Jesus? Not because, I mean, it's true he said to, but... Well, I, you know, that's that's circular logic, right? He says he's the truth, so we have to trust him. Nah. Why is he trustworthy, right? You see that word because he died for us. He died and rose, like he said he was going to, right? He fulfills his promise. He fulfilled. He fulfilled his own work. That's correct. That's correct. Right. And has anybody else done that? I mean, in the history of the world, to that extent. I mean, the people raised from the dead, raised but from the dead, though, passively, right? Has there been anybody who said, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead, and actually pulled it off? No, not even Houdini, I don't think. No. <laughs> I'm right. That's why he's trustworthy. Okay, it's always good to remember that. It's his death and resurrection that's the proof of his trustworthiness. Right? And that's why, pa oh, by the way, that's why pastors... Trustworthy pastors are those who preach the death and resurrection of Jesus. If they don't preach the death and resurrection of Jesus, then you can't trust them. Because that's the word they've been given to preach. They can talk about whatever they want, but if they don't preach that... They're not a pastor. They're not really a pastor. Pretty good. They're not really a pastor. All right. So let's read uh, 12 through 17. We'll cover that. Anybody? Luke doesn't want to read Leah wants to read? No. Which chapter? Or chapter 15. Oh. I'm sorry. We're just backing up. No, am I right? 16. Oh, I'm in the wrong, in the wrong chapter. Sorry, people. 16. Sorry. Well, let's get started. Thanks for... Uh, uh, here we go. Yeah, I think you're right, Ron. We did talk about this. All right, good. So, 16, 16. There we go. Let's do that. Thank you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that a human being has You read a lot farther than I wanted you to read. Um, <laughs> just, I'm just you just, no, you just, I said, it's, okay, I don't know. You just kept going and going and going. All right, we'll catch up on the woman here in a bit. Just so stay away from the analogy, we'll get to that in a minute. A little while, you've heard this, because this is again Easter, which Easter Sunday? Easter 5, maybe? Easter 4? Uh, well, see we, we talked about, last week was Easter 4, or the fourth Sunday of Easter. This one is, you, you all know it because you've heard yeah. the last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, we, like we talked about last week, we've only had the one Easter with me and this lecture. Because this, this last Easter, you probably don't remember at all. Uh, 16 to 22, Easter 4, which is the third Sunday of Easter. So confusing. You already talked, yeah, we talked about the topic last week. So it's John 15, John 16 are the readings through most of the Sundays of Easter, but they're not in order. So they're not continuous readings. We jump forward and backward. Very confusing. There's 
I could, you could write a paper on it, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's been that way for 1,500 years, so we just, I guess we just stop writing. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while, you will see me. All right? So that, that's a pretty simple um, expression. We actually, though, had it, if you remember, back in chapter 14. All right, so um, remember here. There it is. Yeah, uh, verse 19, you see it? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. So these verses uh, from chapter 14, all the way through to, sorry, I want to scroll up a little bit, all the way to, to here. Remember verse 31 in chapter 14? We talked about this. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Right? We said now he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. But wait, there's more. So there's like this false ending, 14 verse 31, and then chapter 15 all the way through to chapter 16 verse 33 is more of what we heard at the end of at the end of this reading. Does that make sense? So it's like it's like um, if you're watching a movie and this is the director's cut or the extended extended ending. So the rest of chapter 14, or excuse me, chapter 15, and then chapter 16 through verse 33, which is, is that the end of chapter 16, verse 33? Mm -hmm. Yeah, chapter 15 and 16 is an expansion of the themes that are at the end of chapter 14. And then chapter 17 is the high priestly prayer, which is either prayed in the upper room, which is my, I think that's right, uh, or could be, could be the prayer that we prayed in the garden as well, I guess so many. All right, so... Um, you're going to see a lot of these themes here in chapter 14 come up again in these last few verses. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, uh, the helper of the Holy Spirit, uh, you'll make your home with you. But here especially, what is it, verse 19? Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, and you will see me. So it's almost as if, let's see if I can get back to where we were. It's almost as if, um, oh yeah, scroll up. Here, he says this again, um, as he said it before, and now the disciples are like, eh, you're going to have to explain this to us. Does that make sense? You need to expand, you need to explain a little bit more. So a little while, you see at 14, but he's talking the same way in chapter 7, chapter 12, chapter 13. He's going to do the same thing in chapter 19. All right? And every time he says in a little while, then they're like, what is he talking about? <laughs> All right? So there's always a comprehension. And it's, and it's always in the context of his return to the Father. Right? And I think that's probably the source of their incomprehension, right? Not that it's going to be a little while and he's going to depart, but that he's going to depart. Right? And then we, remember we talked at length about why that's a good thing that he goes to the Father. Right? Because he sits at God's right hand now, he fills all things. His, as he says before he ascends in Matthew's Gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Right? He's made atonement for the sins of the world and now... Uh, all authority is his, which was always his from creation, but now it's his uh, to proclaim forgiveness, to, to uh, bring all people into the saving knowledge that, of him. Does that make sense? All right. So, a little while, a little while. Uh, there is this kind of fun little interplay. I think it's fun. It's hard to read out loud. I think you've had a good time with it. When I read it in church, I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to read this whole thing again. A little while. What does he mean by a little while? Again, a little while. Why do we keep saying a little while? So there's two things going on there. One, there's emphasis, right? What's the emphasis on? A little while. A little while. That's right. Um, I did note here that this is typical of um, like storytelling or simple narrative in the Middle East. So this is like an idiom. This is a way that they tell stories. When you're telling a child and they're not reading it, you want if you want them to get the point, then you jump into their head and you say, well, what are they? Then you give the perspective. What were they thinking, right? So I don't know. The serpent said, da, 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 da. And, the, and the little boy, he thought, why did the serpent say what he said? And then he repeats what he says, and then go back and explain it. So it's a little repetitive uh, to our ears. This happens a lot more in Hebrew than it does in Greek. Um, you see this kind of repetition. Um, but it's, which, it's perfect for an auditory culture, a, a culture that learns by hearing. Right? We, we aren't really a culture, an auditory culture. I mean, some of us still are. I am. I love I'm listening. I'd rather, I'd rather listen um, to a conversation than watch people talking on the screen. Um, I find that distracting, actually. 
all their mannerisms and everything. I just want to concentrate on the words that they're speaking and the tone of voice and that kind of thing. Uh, but when you see somebody, you, can, you get inflection, you get facial expressions. There's, there's more communication going on there. Um, the problem for me, too, is watching a video of somebody talking is one, boring. But, but two, you know, because when I want to watch a video, I want 100% I want of my attention given to it. But to sit down and watch somebody talk for an hour or whatever on video, it has to be a pretty you know, engaging conversation for it to be worth watching. And that's why they, then they have all the pictures, the illustrations, the diagrams, because they're trying to keep your attention. But if you're telling a story in person, you know, sit on my knee and I'm going to read a story to you or whatever, the visual, the visual goes out, and what, what takes the place of the visual? The hearing. Well, in the hearing, yeah, the, the hearing takes priority, but instead of seeing with your eyes, you still see, but you see with your, yeah. with your mind. With your mind, your imagination, right? Yeah. Right. So it's a different kind of learning, different kind of hearing. That's the culture that Jesus grew up in. Right? They don't have moving pictures. They don't have recordings either. So you, you remember a story by telling it. And retelling it. Yeah, Ron. So, <clears throat> this little while mm -hmm. uh, could refer to any number of things. Yes. Three or four. I think so. Give, which, me, give me some of them. Which, which, no, I just read my footnote. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I think one, you're right. One of them could have been let the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Correct. One could Three have days. been before the, before the crucifixion. From the or from the resurrection to the ascension. Yeah, between the resurrection and the ascension, and another between till Christ returns. Correct, ascension to when He returns. That's right. And it's possible He means all of them. That for the disciples, He's clearly talking about His death and His resurrection, right? Or if I think it's not too much of a stretch because of all the conversation about the Holy Spirit between His ascension to the right hand of the Father and the giving of the Spirit. For them very particularly. But for us, I think it is. It, it's just as appropriately applied to us who are waiting for his coming again. That he, he tells us it's just going to be a little while. Now, granted, we say 2,000 years, but you're like, a day is a thousand years to the Lord, right? It is but a little while to him. We're getting impatient, maybe, but he knows. Well, we shouldn't be surprised by that, because <clears throat> how many different things in the Bible are like that, where they have a meeting at one time and right. a meeting for something else. Yeah, I mean, else. a perfect example at Christmas time is Isaiah 6. Um, with the, or is it 7? With Ahaz, right? Behold, uh, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call it, uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, my God, all of that, right? I think it's, it's not 6, it's 7. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. But uh, the word for virgin there, that's how it's translated in at Christmas time. But it can also just mean young woman. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, who doesn't have a man. So uh, it's true that that was also fulfilled for the king. That his the young woman bride and bore a son, and yeah. so there was an immediate fulfillment for the king, who the prophecy was given to. But it points forward to an even, even greater promise that is to come yet. Okay. And then so then Matthew reveals that to early. Whoever it is, Ron Thomas the child is Yeah, that's Luke. No, that's right, Ron. Uh, the, the word for that in uh, grammar, since you want to learn a new word every time you come, right? Isn't that part of your, your thing? <coughs> Multi, I learned this in high school. Uh, I just love the word, so I, I always try to teach people. Multivalent. Multivalent. And you know what, like a balance, this is, this is a balance, right? Everybody know from window coverings? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so multivalent would be those times where you see where they have like three of those on top of each other. So it'd be like there's the blinds and then if we had curtains, right, on top of that. Yeah, it's multiple valences, multiple layers. It's like an onion, right? You keep peeling the onion and there's multiple levels. I don't know if you peel onions, I cut that. Or like on a stage. On a stage, right. We have the proscenium and you have the, the curtains. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. And so that, and that's the word then for these multiple meanings, right? There's the outer level, there's the inner, the inner. You know, you keep digging and you can see how it applies in different ways, in different contexts. Uh, that isn't to mean that the word doesn't have a clear meaning 
or a normal belief, like a commonly understood meaning. Yeah. But this, this expression, obviously they're confused about it, right? What does he mean? Which little while is he talking about? I mean, we could say it that way. It's a legitimate question. I just felt cold air on my hand, right here. <laughs> oh, okay, that's weird. Um, <laughs> little while, little while, while. What does this mean? By a little while, we don't know what he's talking about. All right, good. For verse 18. Then 19, right? Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Right. Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while, and you will not see me again you will, a little while, and you will see me? And of course, the answer is, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. He knows what he's talking about. There's other places where this happens, where Jesus knows what they're arguing amongst themselves about, and then he kind of inserts himself. I think that might be chapter 7. I'm pretty sure that might be chapter 7, where that happened. All right, so then he says... Truly, truly, so this is prophetic language. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. So for me, that's the suffering and death of Jesus, right? They're, they're like, crucify him, yay, we finally got him, right? And they're weeping and lamenting, right? But the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but here's the key. Your sorrow will turn into joy. And it's actually sorrow will be turned into joy. Alright, so uh, truly, truly means pay attention. That's what that means. Uh, listen up. Here's what's going to happen. Um, so I think you're right, Ron. What could this mean? It could mean the mental anguish of watching you know, their, their mentor, their rabbi suffer and die. I think that's probably the most obvious thing that's going to happen here. Uh, and then they wait for him to raise, be raised from the dead by the Father. Uh, lament and joy, though, is often connected to the illustration that he gives. And this is great. Now, Jesus, you know, obviously, I said something to Anne yesterday, actually. She's like, oh, she was complaining about something physiological. And I'm like, oh, I understand. And she's like, do you really? I'm like, okay, no, I don't actually understand what it's like to be eight months pregnant. Okay. No, no. I, I understand this in a sense that we've been here before. This is, you know, time. You know, I mean, I think I have some concept of. You know, no, you're just supposed to shut up at that point, right? <laughs> just close your mouth. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. Let it be. Let it be. Because um, it isn't the same as the last times anyway. Because, you know, now it's 45. And <laughs> your body. Um, isn't what it once was. I learned that you actually lose like 25% of your IQ points as you get older. You actually do get dumber. I learned that this morning. But uh, your body also starts to... <laughs> yeah, it explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, that and exercise. That and exercise actually maintains the lamination on the neurons. And, yeah, so they keep working. Uh, but Jesus uses the birth analogy. He does this elsewhere too. Luke... 24. We should probably look at that because um, it's pretty profound in that. And Jesus can. Why can Jesus use it? Why can he talk about a lady giving birth? He's not been through it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Except, except what? Well, he's omniscient. But more than that, well, he was the one who gave them the pain in Genesis. Well, that's true. I was saying that's just, he made a woman. <laughs> and he knows woman because he made her. How else could you know? Well, that's what he said to, the, to Eve. Right. Eve. Or God. Yeah, so well, that's Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right. What did he say? Well, that after they sinned and started eating, yeah. labor for her would be painful. painful, and Adam would have to toil. Right. And by the way, I expand that. I say it's not just labor is painful, although that's true, but actually bearing children, oh, right. raising children is also painful. Yeah. Wow. Especially with infant mortality and all that. But, um, all right, so this is the road to Emmaus. So there's a couple things that are common, in common here with what happened. And it's not the birth, it's not the birth story, but it's similar. In that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. 
Um, and while they talk, oh, that's 13, 117, there it is, 17. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are having with each other while you, you walk? And they stood still, looking sad, right? So they're lamenting. It's the same word, by the way, for lament. But we can say sad. And then notice he does some preaching to them. They have the Lord's Supper, or he offers them the bread and wine, then he disappears. And then... They said to each other, verse 32, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? All right, so there's the lament being turned to joy. And then 41, he appears to them um, here, still while they were still disbelieving for joy and were marveling. This expression is so weird. They disbelieved for joy. Yeah. Uh, and were marveling. He said to them, Have you anything here to eat? So you see how the, the sorrow is being turned into joy at his resurrection. But how? As he reveals himself to them, as he speaks to them. That's how sorrow is turned into joy. Right? So, I mean, this is what we do like a Christian funeral, where there's sorrow. We also preach the resurrection. Right? But that disbelieving for joy, it's such, like I said, it's a very weird where, where is that that Verse 41. Yeah, I like what Gabe just said. Gabe, say that again. It's too good to be true. Yeah, it's too good to be true. So they refuse to believe for um, for joy, for Carol. All right, so yeah, it's too good to be true. And they're actually scared of being happy, of being joyous. So scared that they won't believe. All right? It'd be kind of like, I don't know, maybe you're a fan of a political candidate, um, you know, and that candidate appears to, you know, that's it. It's all done. And then something happens. And you're like, that can't, no, that can't, that can't be true. That, what? And then it happens, and you're like, wow. I, and, and you just don't want to, you just, you don't want to be disappointed. So rather than believe it, you're just like, I'm waiting to be vindicated, because I've been saying for a few weeks, three weeks, you know, that, It'll be fine. We'll get through it. But no, we're like no, no, no. Like, no. There's nothing about this election that was normal. Sorry. Uh, all right. So where are we? We're in Luke. So you have some similar expressions there in Luke. And then the woman giving birth, obviously Genesis three sixteen is one. Uh, but it's all over in the Old Testament, especially Isaiah. So another guy who likes to talk about childbirth. I mean, how dare he, right? They will be dismayed, pangs and agony will seize them, they will be in anguish like a woman in labor, they will look aghast at one another, their faces will be aflame. I think, you know, I want to be a little bit funny about this. You know, this is what, like, Isaiah knows of childbirth, is like standing outside with the other men while the women are helping the woman give birth. So, again, he's using his ears, he can't see what's happening, and so of course he's going to be like, that sounded really terrible. True, right? It doesn't sound good from the outside. You know, depending on the woman. Some people are actually. My sister in law is very quiet, which is strange. I think that's why years ago they didn't allow the man in the what? delivery room. Because they just they kind of, they let it <laughs> Yeah, which, which is dumb. Because because you need the visual, you need to understand, and you're like, oh, I oh okay. I mean, I still don't get it, but you know, at least I have. A, I don't have to use my imagination. All right, so, so again, the woman in childbirth is referring here to the Lord's judgment and the destruction that will come upon sinners. Um, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 26 is another one. All right, so Isaiah loves this one. Uh, o Lord, in distress they sought you, they poured out a whispered prayer when your dis discipline was upon them. Like a pregnant woman who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near to giving birth. <laughs> so were we because of you, O oh Lord. We were pregnant, we writhed, but we have given birth to win. Oh, that's interesting. We've accomplished that deliverance on you. Alright. Now, why, I mean, why, why use this analogy so much? Because, like you said, it's the, one of the first signs given of, of original sin, of sin, that we brought into the world. Right? So every time a child is born, we remember not only that God gives life, but also that we're born in sin. Right? And so then that becomes an analogy for, um, for sin. Okay, what is it? Uh, 42? 
Or do I go to the line in Isaiah 26, uh -huh. verse 19? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay. What's that? Um, oh, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise, you who dwell in the dust and wake and sing for joy. Right? The earth will give birth to the dead. The earth will give birth to the dead. This is why when Jesus confronts the Sadducees and how they deny the resurrection, it's like, why, why don't they believe in the resurrection? You know why? They didn't know the scriptures. They did know the scriptures, but they, they only accepted, as canon, the books of Moses. Yeah, they didn't read Ezekiel, they didn't read Isaiah, they didn't read the prophets, the Tanakh, as, as the Hebrews call it, or Jews call it today, the Tanakh, the prophets. They didn't read the writings of the Tanakh, the writings, the writings of the prophets. Because the prophets, I mean, there's resurrection of the body in Moses as well, but it's, it's much more, what do you want to say, veiled, less obvious. And the prophets, it's through and through. I mean, or just read Job. They don't even read Job. Like, I know my Redeemer lives on the last day, and I will see him face to face. You're like, that sounds like the resurrection. Yeah, so no, they, the Sadducees denied the other books. They only had the first five books of the Bible, of the scriptures. All right, here's 42. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I think, you know, our, our liturgy, our church services are kind of boring. Because that's what should be happening. <laughs> Before, you know? So you, I, I have to wait until you start crying out, Lord, save us! Forgive me my sins! And then I'll, then I'll cut it. No, it'd be beautiful. But instead, it's on that board, miserable sin. I'm just I'm having fun. Yeah. But that, I mean, that is, whether that happens physically, verbally, that is, what's, that is what happens in the conscience when you know your sin, right? It's, it's this like you're trying to squirm and get away from it, and it's terrifying. Uh, did I get more? Oh, yeah. I don't even think I gave them all. I only gave you some of them. Here's 66. Uh, the sound and noise. Where is that? Oh, there it is. The sound of an uproar from the city, a sound from the temple, the sound of the Lord rendering recompense to his enemies. Before she was, quote, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who has heard such things? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? This is the postscript. This is the last chapter of Isaiah. Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, Jerusalem, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I cause who spring, or to, who cause to bring forth, shut the womb, says your God? Of course, the answer is no. Rejoice, O Jerusalem, and be glad for her. All you who love her, rejoice with her in joy. All you who mourn over her, that you may nurse be satisfied for her consoling Christ. That you may drink deeply with the light from her glorious abundance. This is all, again, the last chapter of Isaiah. All has been, we've been propelling towards this for 10 chapters, from 55 to 66, 11 chapters. And it's the fulfillment of the last day when all will be brought into completion. And, um, Finally, we who are laboring in birth pains until now, as Paul will say, you know, will be delivered safely into, into heaven. So, so uh, yeah, going down, as Ron pointed out from back to Isaiah 26, that our death, we're put into the grave, and then we're, we're actually dragged out of the earth on the last day, again, with, with trumpets and the cry of command. And it's like the earth gives birth to us, right? And as we raise, are raised from the dead. Beautiful stuff, right? Uh, and then, of course, Micah, 1 Thessalonians 5, that's the one I was just quoting from Paul. And then, of course, uh, there's the, the, it gets a little weird if you start to read commentaries on this, because then they're like, well, I should get back to our actual text. This, uh, Jesus is referring to Mary, you know, because anytime he mentions a woman, it's always Mary, for a particular school of interpretation. You know which school I'm talking about. Be the Roman Catholics, right? It's always about Mary. That's by the way. That's why everything's blue in Advent. Did you know this? Why it switched to blue back in the 50s, 60s? Because it's Mary's color. They even changed the last reading uh, for the fourth Sunday in Advent as a sun, as Mary's as a Sunday, another feast for Mary. Actually, uh, we keep and you hear the Magnificat. Um, it's an alternate reading for us. I still do the John the Baptist. But it blew for Mary, and then we never talk about Mary through the whole season. <laughs> so the, the historic color was, was violet, like Lent. 
because the seasons are very similar. Uh, but then you would need two sets of violet, like one that has you know more lenten and cross of crown of thorns and that kind of stuff, and then a set for advent that's more what candles or uh, the manger or, or kind of a advent. I don't know, Jesus coming in on the clouds would be cool too. That'd be a really cool advent set. You know, Jesus coming in on the clouds. Yeah, yeah I'm really good at that stuff. I can make one. <laughs> Why don't you make one? <laughs> yeah, you make it. We should, yeah, I mean, most of I think we're all our sets. I don't think we've purchased any of our sets, right? They were all made for us. Yeah, they were all made for us. So, I mean, that's the wonderful tradition of the have the church make the parents investment. Somebody, or people. All right, so what are we talking about? Leah, she never remembers the anguish for joy, the, a human being. I love that. I, it doesn't matter what you read. They're always trying to be gender neutral on these things. Uh, what, anybody have a different translation of that, 21, instead of a human being? To a child. A child? Ooh. I'm not getting her to a child. Pain because the oh, no, no, that part's the same, yeah. No, that part is the same, but I mean the last part. For joy that a human oh. being was born for. Yeah, man. Man, what kind of Bible do you have? King James. Yeah, that's literal. That's actually what it says. For the man was born, right? right. So, so if you don't do that, I mean, it's in the terms of my sixth grade teacher, God bless her, she she was she hated gender neutral language. <laughs> she hated it. She like this was like her I don't know like agenda. She was going to teach us all to hate this. So she would point this out: man, mankind, right? And and human includes man, right? And woman, <laughs> all right? Because who came first? It's in the Bible. Man, and then woman was taken from the man. It doesn't say that. That doesn't mean woman's inferior. It's there's just a uh, that's that's the ordering of things. Uh, mankind refers to all people, women, man, child, all colors, all nationalities. What? We're the ones that like to break things down and distinguish where there aren't distinctions made, or where distinctions are helpful. Right, anyway, it's man. Which is helpful because then Jesus, of course, he's referring back. He might be referring back to Mary. Okay. Uh, was she overjoyed that man was born in the world? Yes, because Jesus is the new man, or you say the new Adam, if you want to use his name. Right. So, as one man brought sin into the world in judgment, so one man, go Paul here, brought forgiveness. That's right. That's why man is important. I know you can say human being. You're making it unnecessarily complicated, and you're actually you're actually hiding some of the theological import of it by by trying to be inclusive in a way that you don't actually need to be, because um, it's already inclusive. It's speaking to Jesus. Uh, yeah. So maybe Mary herself, and of course, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, it could be the lady in, in Revelation too. Twenty-one. Revelation. Oh, nine. No, twelve. Sorry, twelve. Revelation 12. You know the woman and the and the serpent and death and destruction and she's in labor and the world's going to hell around her, literally. It's kind of fun stuff this time of year. This every four years. Apocalyptic language. Alright, let's keep going. I actually wanted to read a lot more today. And I'm just ranting. We're doing okay. Alright. So you have sorrow now. Oh, we didn't read this yet. Because I stopped you. 22. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Amen, amen, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. All right, very good. So we have that joy language, and so we have the analogy of the woman giving birth, and then, when the, and then she doesn't remember her pain anymore. It isn't that you don't remember that you were in pain, but you don't remember exactly what the pain was like. Because memories are faulty that way. 
you remember it was bad, but you can't like put yourself back in the position that you were in when it happened and, and feel the same pain that you felt then. It's, it's the mem you have the memory of it, but it's not the same. Uh, so in a way, it kind of goes away. The Lord takes that from you. So you have sorrow now, right? Because he keeps saying a little while, I'm going to depart from you. Make sense? So of course they're sorrowful. But I will see you again. So I think resurrection, that's clearly one of there. And your hearts will rejoice. Although they didn't really rejoice all that much when Jesus appeared to them in the upper room, did they? They kept the doors shut and they didn't go anywhere. But eventually, right? And no one will take your joy from you. Why? It's your joy, but it's joy that's given to you. And it's joy not based upon who you are or what you've done, but it's joy that's grounded in who Jesus is for you. Right? And that's why they can't take it from you. Because they can't take Jesus from you. Does that make sense? Yeah. For people. Um, what happens when, when somebody says, you know, I, I, I've had this happen. Uh, I'm having trouble going to church because it's just not joyous for me. But I can't remember. Yeah, I know. And not every Sunday is going to be, you know, a rip roaring good time. Sometimes, sometimes uh, the preaching or the hymn or the reading is going to hit you in a way that gives you joy. Other times you might leave actually feeling the weight of your sin more than you do joy. Depends on how the Holy Spirit works upon you that day. I mean, God willing, you'll, you'll always hear the word forgiveness and you know that. And nobody can take that from you. Right? Because you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, it was given to you. Like any gift. You know. I mean, Jesus is not a... What's the opposite of a re-gifter? Who's the person who takes a gift back? Do we have a term for that? People... My grandmother was this way. Indian. An Indian giver! That's, that's it! Yeah. It's true. I knew there was a term for it. She would come, and she would look around the house, God rest her soul, she would look around the house and she'd make sure that the gift she gave was on display, right? We learned this the hard way. And if it wasn't out, it wasn't about, or it wasn't being used, she'd be like, do you want me to just take it back? You know, I, I'm sure I could find somebody who would like to use it, or would appreciate it. And you gave it to me. Well, yeah, but I didn't give it to you. Keep in a box. Ironically, she was kind of a pack rat, a very organized one. She had boxes and boxes of stuff, organized, but not on display. Nobody saw it. She kept, okay, so after uh, they cleaned out the house, my grandfather died too, and then uh, my mom gave me like all of, all of the Christmas cards I wrote to her, all the thank you notes. She kept them all. She had them organized. That sounds like my mom. I appreciate it. I mean, it's right. But I don't know. Do you think she went through the box and looked at those thank you notes over here and like, oh, look at how appreciative my grandson is? Maybe she did. Maybe she did. I'm not trying to be charitable about that. I don't know. I read the thank you note. I said thank you, and I threw it away. You know, I, I appreciate the card. That, 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 I think that's the limit of the purpose of the card because I received your thank you. I suppose we could put it up on on the wall. When well, I was carrying, I went to this older. Couple's house uh, to the western. And I just had to clean it for two hours, but it was his birthday. And like the day before, a couple days before, and already the birthday card was some of these things. I thought, we keep it for a week. We had Christmas cards up from two years ago. There's no one. You cash, forget the card. <laughs> I like how you think. Alright. So. Um, anyway, so what are we talking about? Joy. Oh, yes, joy comes. Um, it comes from the word of Jesus. And if this is, it's hard for this to not be heard as an indictment, but if this was my response, look, I'm like, if you don't find joy in the good news that Jesus proclaims to you, the problem isn't with the good news. The problem's not with Jesus, the problem's with you. Right? You're unwilling to hear it, to receive it. You, know, you don't want it, or, or you don't like it, or you don't appreciate it. Then I've had people say that in a helpful way. They're like, look, you talked about how, I'm trying to make an example, you know, you talked about how um, our, our relationship to Jesus it is, well, he does this in, in multiple times, is like being, um, being his holy bride, right? And he's the bridegroom. But the person was in kind of a rocky or not, not a great marriage. And so the illustration didn't really bring true, or, or it didn't bring 
it didn't give them any joy or comfort because when they think of marriage, they didn't think of it the way that Jesus gives it. So the problem was really with the individual more than it was with Jesus in the description, his analogy, um, likening our relationship to him as a bride to a brighter. So the problem being with the hearer, not with Jesus himself. So I think that, that's what's going on here with joy, right? Nobody can take the joy from you because they can't take me from you. You can, of course, not be joyous and hide away in your upper room and be fearful of everyone else and not go about your life free of fear, right? Thinking of a Zechariah's song, right? Free to worship him without fear all the days of our life, right? That's, that's what you want. You want to be joy. You want to be like Zechariah where your tongue is loosened to praise, praise him and you just go about, you go about rejoicing in all things, knowing that your salvation is here. That's what Jesus is. That's what he's working in you by his spirit through his word. Uh, but then another prophetic thing, and we've heard this stuff before, 23 and 24. Um, and that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now this can confuse you a little bit. There's a note on, on the sheet in that um, both in Romans 8 and Hebrews something, um, Jesus is interceding for us before the heavenly throne. Uh, Hebrews 7. All right, this will come up in the next few verses as well. And that, but he says here, he's not going to intercede. We can just directly speak to the Father, right? Um, rather than him praying for us, we have immediate access to the Father. We can pray, our Father who art in heaven, right? Well, on what basis? He tells you here, on the basis of his name. All right? This is really important when it comes to prayer. I actually heard this on a podcast, and I, I, I really appreciated the comment. Is don't pray, dear God. Be specific. And uh, and actually, the Lutheran on the show, it was a bunch of reform people, and then our Lutheran was on there too, was like, yeah, it's one of the things that's really kind of aggravating because it takes some time, but to pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, or the Father of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, right? And, just do that whole long ending, but why? So that we always remember that we pray to the Father through the Son, by the Spirit. So use the prepositions used in the New Testament. But the reason that you can pray to the Father, call him God the Father, Heavenly Father, whatever, is on the basis of his Son. That's why even the shorter call acts would be to God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Even without the long, long end. Right? And the Spirit is always the living active, both in the Father and the Son. But at least pray to the Father on behalf of the Son, or pray to Jesus, right, but acknowledge the Father, acknowledge the Spirit. Um, generic God talk, the, the problem with it is, uh, because it's not so specific, is that you can slip easily then into false doctrine. And But also, when God wants you to pray, He wants you to pray based on His Word. So, the exercise then is this, when you pray like to the Father, you're even before you open your mouth, think about, well, what has the Father promised me? What do I have on the basis of him being my Father, God the Father, right? Or Creator, say God the Holy Spirit, the Creator. Well, how can I pray on that basis? And then use God's Word. So, for example, you know, Heavenly Father, you gave me new birth through my baptism. Right? So that's the way we use your Father is through baptism. Right? And in baptism, you join me to your Son. Right? So, be specific. I always do this um, with the kids in catechism. Those of you, I'm sure you've all had, my kids have all had me for catechism. I was like, well, you know, who saved you? God did. I'm like, be specific. What's his name? Yeah, Jesus. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus is getting after here. Right? Pray in his name to the Father. If you pray in his name, you can pray. You have access to the Father. Right? So, you are a Christian. You have his name upon your core in your heart. And he will give it to you. Of course, we've talked about that. Does that mean he's going to give you a pony or a Ferrari? <laughs> no, I mean, he'll give you whatever. You can't pray in Jesus' name without praying according to his word. Because if you don't pray according to his word, you're actually misusing his name. Does that make sense? You just think second commandment, right? Curse, swear, use satanic arts, liar, deceived by his name, but call upon it 
and having trouble praying praise and things. Right? And his name's attached to his work. Uh, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Right? Ask, and you will receive that your joy will be full. Right. Uh, and why ask, by the way? Why ask for it? Is he gonna, are you gonna, do you get it anyway? Yes. Yeah. But you ask that you would believe. And believing, you have joy. But without faith, acknowledging that every good thing, especially your salvation comes from Jesus, there's no faith, there's no joy either. There's nothing to be happy about, or joyous about. I'm sorry if this sounds a little bit, what do you want to say? Logically circular or something? But no complaint, everybody understanding what's going on here? I don't want to be linger if I don't need to. Okay, good. Speaking of which, I have said these things to you in figures of speech, in parables, in riddles, in a cryptic saying. You could translate it any of those ways. So even Jesus acknowledges that what he's saying is a little bit, I'm not really sure. I mean, we, we obviously understand it more because we're on this side of the resurrection. But to them, they're like, okay, Jesus, whatever you're talking about. Uh, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in these parables or figures of speech or cryptic sayings or what was the other one? Riddle. But will tell you plainly about the Father. And we talked about the word for tell you plainly. That's actually one word in Greek. Uh, that was back in... I don't know if I wrote it down. This I say seven, 7 verse 13. So, is that right? Let's go see what 7 verse 13 says. Oh no, this is where he didn't speak openly. It's the same word. No one spoke openly to him for fear of the Jews. All right? So we're contrasting here. He's going to speak openly, clearly, um, and they don't. Sorry, just go back. They will they don't speak clearly. This is that it's that word for speaking. I feel like we had it like in the last chapter. I should have written it down. It has to do with um, confession of faith. Opening your lips. Um, I wish I could remember. I see. I tried to find it. I couldn't find it the other day, so I didn't put it on the notes either. All right. So tell you plainly. Yeah, seven thirteen is the same word, but it's not here. It's parousia. Somebody that if they had all your sheets, you could go look it up. Freshness, openness, frankness. It could be, it could be translated any of those ways. I know I wrote it on a sheet, and I put it in Greek on the sheet, Parisian. So if you have your stack of sheets, you might find it. And there was Greek on the last one. There was Greek on the last one. Yeah, that, that was for convict. That was for convict, okay. And so it's probably a while ago. Right, speaking openly, plainly. Uh, how is he going to speak openly and plainly about the Father? By the Spirit. Right, they'll understand what he's talking about later on, right? When the Spirit opens their hearts and wants to understand the things he said, and remember the things that he said. He's been talking, he's been saying this many times in God's gospel. I gave you a list of, a whole list of it here. Uh, chapter 2, verse 22, chapter 6, verse 61, 62, 73, 7, verse 39. He keeps saying this. Um, and John does it like parenthetically, even. He says, These things they did not understand at first, but later they understood him, right? Like, like this one. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. All right, talking about on the third day I'll raise it up, referring to his body. Right. Um, in the synoptic tradition, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they call this uh, the messianic secret. Have you ever heard that term? It's especially the case in Mark's gospel, right, where it's just nobody understands until after his resurrection. Like, like everything is veiled from the people. It doesn't make sense for them. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't believe him. It's that they don't understand what, he's, what he means. They don't have the full context yet to understand the import of the words that he speaks. That's not the same as unbelief. All right? This is why, um, there's much more accommodation made for the for the apostles 
or excuse me, the disciples and their confusion than there is for you. You actually don't have the same excuse they have because you know the rest of the story. Quote somebody. What was his name? Paul Harvey? And that's, and that's the rest of the story. I, by the way, if you, if you like Paul Harvey, um, in the tradition of Paul Harvey um, is a show called, uh, and that's the way I heard it, I think. That's the way I heard it, yeah. It's um, the Dirty Jobs guy. What was his name? What's his Mike name? Rowe. Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe, yeah. I think it's like in the top five podcasts in the world. But it's short. Um, and he just started reading through his book, or he does a lot of the stories. So the last one was about Mel Brooks uh, at the Battle of the Bulge. Which is pretty cool. Cool story. But it, it's the same thing. And that's the way I heard it. And he kind of he hides the meaning until the very end, and they're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's how, the, that's how the scriptures work for the disciples. Jesus speaks to them. A lot of it is veiled. They remember it by the Spirit later, but then they understand it in context now. Okay, I see what he was after. Right? And so, yeah, you don't have the same excuse because you know the resurrection, you know the ascension, and you have the gift of the Spirit. Now, by your baptism. Um, so, yeah, Christians are held to a different standard than those who are outside of faith. Or, you know, uh, in that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, as we just talked about, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God, right? So believing Jesus, you have access to the Father, and the Father loves you on the basis of your love of the Son. Got it? I came from the Father, and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So now he's explaining what he means by a little while. That's what he means. So now that is, very specifically, the ascension, is it not? Yeah. Uh, but, but the death and resurrection is bound up in that because he can't return to the Father unless he has done the will of the Father, which is to die for the sins of the world. And having accomplished that, the Father raises him from the dead and, and then receives him in the ascension. Make sense? You can't, come, you can't come home until you've done the job. If you want to put it that way. That's kind of callous, but it's like, don't come home until, I'm trying to think of the expression. I don't. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to see you home until something. Really happens. It sounds like a terrible parent. Don't come. Don't come back. Don't talk to me again until you've X Y Z. Okay. Don't ask me again until I feel like it. I don't know. <laughs> right. That's not how the Father talks. Because Jesus, Jesus is well, and the Father is well, and one. So they don't have that kind of conflict. All right, ah, then his disciples said, you, now you are speaking plainly. Yay, and they're not using figurative speech. Thank goodness. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. All right, good so far, right? Uh, anything out there? No, that's fine. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Huh. Well, behold, the hour is coming, and indeed it has come, is now, right? When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Ouch. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. Well, ultimately, until he says, My God, my God, are you forsaken me? I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Which is interesting, right? Because it's much like what we heard from Zechariah, where Zechariah rejoices in God, you know, that God has saved him, and yet Jesus hasn't actually died and risen from the dead yet to save him. And yet Zechariah rejoices in his salvation. As did all the prophets, as did all the patriarchs, right? Whether it uh, was Moses, Noah, Abraham, whoever had the promise, Isaac, Jacob, they all rejoiced. Um, how does Jesus say it? They rejoiced to see my day. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. That was back in John something. Well, wait a minute. Abraham didn't see the day of, of Jesus' resurrection, right? Because he's, he'd been dead. No, Abraham died. Our fathers died. What chapter was that in? It might be, I think it's chapter 8 or 9. Um, and what's Jesus' point? The point is, yes, he has seen the day of resurrection. 
not eye to eye, but face to face, but by faith in the promise. That's the promise. He rejoiced to see my day. So did David. So yeah, they all did. Right? And now he's saying he's already overcome the world, but he hasn't even done it yet. He's already done it. Uh, that's easy enough for us to understand. I think we talk about Hebrew understanding of time being cyclical. But for Jesus, now is forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In one sense, he hasn't yet done it. In another sense, he's already done it. So think of like Colossians 1. Colossians 1. I finally memorized where it is. I already quoted it, but I never could remember where it is. <laughs> and I finally gave up and I said, I need to actually memorize where, where this is in the Bible. Um, all right, so I got, but now I have to remember. Colossians 1, what? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, there it is. I think 16, maybe? All right, so... Uh, here we go. Look at this. Speaking of time. He is the image, speaking of Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. We well, talk a lot about that, right? And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. But in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God had was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of his, of his cross. Isn't that something? That he's preeminent, that he made all things, and he's redeemed all things. And all of that, Paul doesn't have this flat sense of, linear sense of time. It's like he's flat in future and past and present all into now. Now. Like that hymn that I really don't enjoy. Now, now, now the silence, now the... You know this one? You know that one? Now the silence? You've sung it? Yeah. Now, now, now. It's now, now, now. I, it's too repetitive for me. I'm sorry. But, I mean, I get the sentiment of it. But it's modern. It is. Yeah, it's Lord Supper now. I'll just read it to you. It's one stanza. It's not long. But it does It does actually convey... I told this. you it a few weeks ago. Yeah. No. Sure. No, we didn't see you talk about it. No, I, I talked about it. No, 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 I went too far. No, no, no. Yeah, all the time by history telling. No, that's a different one. Come, let us see. No. No mortal flesh. No. Thy body. No. We'll be crazy. There's an index on the back. It shouldn't be that hard. That's one I know. It's on this side of the page. Are you all right. Fine. Nine ten. It's actually at the back. I was in the wrong section. It's at the beginning of the sermon. Here it is. Now the silence, now the peace, now the empty hands uplifted, now the kneeling, now the plea, now the Father's arms in welcome, now the hearing, now the power, now the vessel brimmed, brimmed for pouring, now the body, now the blood, now this joyful celebration, now the wedding, now the songs, now the heart forgiven leaping, now the spirit, this spirit's visitation, now the son's epiphany. Now the Father's blessing. Now, now, now. There must be another thing that has now. Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, you're thinking of, I said, now that my tongue, the mystery of telling. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that one has a lot more nows. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I, I mean, you get the idea that present tense, right? God is for us, present tense, now. Not he was for us, or he will be for us. You know, we don't have to look forward to heaven. We don't have to or only look forward to heaven, or only look back to what he did at the cross, but that he's present for us now, bringing, I mean, literally, you know, to him, it's, he just died for us, and, yeah, you were going to say something. Um, I just have a question that I was looking up here. You were referring to something in Mark before, but the yes. disciples didn't understand Jesus. Yeah, it's called the Messianic Secret, yes. Um, verse 32 of chapter 9, Mark. Okay. Or Jesus says the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men who have killed him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he means or what he meant. And we're afraid to ask him. We're afraid to ask him. Yeah. That, that's, Why is that even in there? That's because that's what happens in Mark's Mark has that emphasis. 
that they, they just, they listened, but they didn't, they didn't push them on it. They didn't try to seek to understand. Uh, which is interesting because, like in Luke's gospel, you know, 12 year old Jesus is in the temple asking them questions, and they're asking him questions, and they and they're that's what the with the priests in the temple, with the scholars, the Bible scholars, they're they're going back and forth asking each other's questions. But the disciples don't. The disciples must have been with Jesus for quite some time. At this point, uh, let's see, Capernaum, uh, it's probably chapter nine. It's probably been a year or two at this point. Well, he's talking about the the, uh, the mute spirit. He's going to be betrayed. Yeah, you know, he hasn't quite turned to. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, maybe year two or year two and a half, somewhere in there. Yeah, it is interesting. So, I mean, this is one of the things with the Gospels. They, they each have their own, I don't know, nuance, flavor, slant, slant right? John has, has been very much about expanding the mysteries, not necessarily explaining them. <laughs> but showing you the depth of them, you know, to actually increase your sense of awe and wonder. Like all this language about the Father and the Son and the Spirit and their inner relationship and how they, they work together for your salvation, but also how you can pray to the Father in the name of the Son by the Spirit. The Spirit comes to comfort you, but to reveal to you all that Jesus said, which was given him to say by the Father. You know, all of that kind of language that we've been talking about, that inter-Trinitarian you know, relationship and dialogue, which isn't in the other Gospels. Now, why would John do that? Well, I think it's actually, one, because it's beautiful, and two, because Jesus said it, but, but probably also um, because it's helpful for us to understand that, that not only is God triune, there's three persons, but that those three persons are always working together for your benefit. Right. So even as the Father made all things, as we read in Colossians, he made all things through his Son, who is the Word incarnate and made flesh later. So, yeah, that's good. Well, let's, I, think we, I think we got it. Did we finish verse 33? Did I talk about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. These things I've said to you, that in me, that, I wanted to emphasize this, in me you may have peace. All right. And it's kind of like what I talked about in the sermon today. Right? You know, people, I'll tell you where that sermon came from. Uh, I should probably send you the link or something. Um, it was a doc, it was a conversation, a radio program, but well, actually it's, it's a YouTube show uh, by a Roman Catholic who's a faithful Roman Catholic um, who's not happy with the Pope, the current Pope. Um, specifically, this current Pope has now allied himself with, of all people, the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. So, like, what is the Pope doing with the Communist Party and with the Rothschilds? And the Rothschild, uh, I mean, he spoke with whatever it means, Marianne Rothschild. Um, Probably trying to get some money. Well, it's always about money, but it's about money, power, influence, and it's the violence, actually. And it's the same kind of language that's what he's doing. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought you were the head of a church. It's no, it's, it's power, to, it's authority, it's control. It's they, the, the Vatican doesn't want to be disqualified from having a place on the world stage. And so instead of standing up for the truth, according to God's word, he actually misquotes the Bible in the presentation, the Pope does, in a terrible way. And, and then what does he want? He just wants to be, he wants the, the Roman church to be important of, and to be like seen as a collaborator with all of these, these efforts for one world government, one world economy, one world you know, food, and economy. It's about moving everybody into cities, out of small towns and farms, consolidating farms, all that kind of stuff. And what's the Pope have to do with any of that? It sounds like the book Pillars of the Earth. It does. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And the papacy has been about this, since, I mean, at least since the time of Luther and beforehand. They've always wanted to be important in the eyes of the world. And you're like, what does it say here? No, we don't have peace through your collaboration with actually a really terrible government. The Chinese Communist Party, I mean, they've got, you have millions of Muslims and Christians in concentration camps, and they're harvesting body, like hair and body parts. Um, this is, these are not people that you want to have as your friends. Um, but he sees, he doesn't want to be irrelevant. He doesn't want the church to be irrelevant. It's already irrelevant. You're not going to preach Christ. China makes it. Nope. 
I mean, well, in a way, they do because they're atheistic. That's right. right. But he's an atheist too. Well, just this morning, John um, heard something on the news about Kamala Harris making something in common about Christianity. Oh, yeah. Which was very. Yeah. Disturbing. Well, no. This is the thing. People say, well, how can, how can Mr. Biden be a Roman Catholic? Because he's a Roman Catholic in the way of the Pope. Not in the way of the faithful Catholics who actually believe Jesus and want to follow his word. And yes, they're confused on, on some doctrine, but on the whole, actually, we can still call Christians. Based on what the Pope was saying, I can't even call him a Christian. And if you really want to see a great example of this, look at the nativity scene at St. Peter's oh, this year. Yes. Yeah. You've seen it? Oh, my God. With the space aliens? Yeah. There's, there's space they're, aliens they're, at the nativity. <laughs> there's Sumerian gods. It's all. It's horrible. It it's, is. I understand the sentiment that you want to represent some art from places in the world, um, but you don't put space aliens at the nativity. I'm sorry, that's, that's out in front of your church. That's kind of yeah. that's kind of weird. No, um, and there's other stuff in the Vatican itself. Actually, there's all sorts of pagan iconography. They have, they have a strong connection in that video that we watch. I should link to it. The guy's name is Michael Matt. The show is called Michael Matt. Um, it's, it's called the RCC. It's the it's the it's the Roman Communist something. Is the video? I watch his videos because I he's a faithful Catholic, um, and it's very interesting to hear somebody within the Catholic Church actually being like Luther, saying we got some major problems here, and you know the the child abuse the sex abuse scandal is actually par for the course if you're gonna align yourself with these atheistic governments that have no regard for humanity. That doesn't make sense. Uh, what happened there? No, they also have a strong, uh, within the Vatican, there's, there's, there's lots of iconography attached to Freemasonry as well, which is another. Uh, the Freemasons are one of the many groups throughout time who have tried to unite the world under one secret you know, government. They're one of them. My grandfather was one. I read, I read the material. That was their goal. I wanted to think. It's like, yeah, they wanted to just, wanted to, like, for it to be a business network. But, but internationally, yeah, they were trying to influence political leaders and get a common. Um, why did I bring this up? Oh, yes. In the, in the world, you're in a tribulation. In the Roman Church, in the Communist Party, in the, I would argue, uh, in the political parties in our country, maybe, too. But, but with all that stuff happening around us, where are we to find our comfort, our hope, our peace? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Right. Which is why I've said now that we know we know about the virus. I mean, we're not going to close again. There's no medical reason to do it, scientific reason to do that. And we actually need to be present with one another around God's word with the things that are happening in the world around us. Because without that, this is our respite. This is our... Um, when I say oasis, um, we're in the world, but not of the world. Um, so that's what's going on here. And then.